All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first regular monthly meeting of Fusion. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the country that I live on and where I am today. I acknowledge Gadigal elders past and present, and I acknowledge that we're all signing in from many First Nations across the continent. Our new Labor government has committed to furthering the Uluru Statement from the heart after a long delay. That is a voice to parliament, treaty and truth telling. It's been 45 years since Australia last updated its constitution. It's not something we do very often. And this current term of government should be our best chance that we've had in a long time to bring the constitution in line with the expectations of modern Australia. And there are plenty of other areas um, that I think we would say are ripe for, um, for reform. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Andrea Leong, and um, I um, have been for the last uh, six months or so the president of Fusion. We'll get on to that. Um, but firstly, I would like us to remember uh, Philip Sutton, uh, a good friend and climate campaigning partner to many. Philip died unexpectedly earlier this week. And among many other things, Philip was the co-author of Climate Code Red, a climate emergency book from 2008. And he was the initiator of the global climate emergency declaration movement. Philip was also a co-founder of one of Fusion's branch parties, Save the Planet, and so has worked closely with um, Adrian Whitehead and Bryony Edwards. And thank you, Bryony, for these words. Uh, Philip's always 20 years ahead of the pack, so please heed his words on climate rescue from a recent podcast. I'll put the link in the text chat in a moment. It's inspiring and succinct. Our thoughts and deepest sympathies are with Philip's loved ones at this time. Uh, let me get this podcast link. All right, is that back to the slideshow? Yeah. Oh, were you going to share a link of his podcast? Oh, um, I thought I had done that actually. Yeah, that should be in the chat right now. Oh, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Oh, I've done it again. <sighs> There's no going back, only forward. Very apt. So firstly, uh, we've got some updates related to the party. The first of these is the presidency. Now I have stepped down from the position of president um, that I've held since December 15th. Um, it's been a wild ride and I will stay on the executive and uh, my plan is to build up a communications team. Um, it's, it's been uh, a lot of fun to be a part of the leadership team and I'm really glad to be staying on the executive. And the executive has unanimously appointed Roger Watling to the role of president. Um, I'll also note just here that the executive positions will all be open for election at the annual general meeting later in the year. So we have that democratic process coming up in a few months. Roger's also the current secretary of Fusion and the, was the second Senate candidate for Queensland in the election just gone. Um, and Roger's also on the, the National Council for the Pirate Party branch. And I'm very glad that someone with a, a strong knowledge of what's happened in the last 10 months um, is in the president role right now at, at this uh, critical stage of the party's development. Um, so I'll hand over to Roger and um, uh, Roger, you can say any words you would like, but then I'll um, hand over to you to present the membership section as well. Awesome. Thanks, Andrea. Um, and a really big thank you to you for um, for the, the oversight and the um, presiding over our, our little group through the last six months um, and before that as well. So bringing, uh, as the leader of Science Party, bringing science on board with 
with the merger and with this cooperative group um, that came together to form Fusion. I think it's been a, an amazing um, experience over the last six, eight, whatever months that it's been since we started the negotiations. So that's, um, that's really great. Um, and I'm really stoked to be taking on this role, be able to fill in for the, uh, for the president's role uh, up until the AGM. Um, as Andrea mentioned, that's an opportunity for all members um, to put their hands up in across all of the leadership roles in the executive um, committee. So that's generally held around November. Uh, so definitely, you know, for those who are interested, please um, consider that. Feel free to reach out to existing members to find out um, what that means and, and how you can contribute to that in the future. Um, there's going to be lots of strategic thinking and planning happening um, over the next little while and long while, probably as well as a fair bit to do. Um, in the short term, we're also putting together some really cool initiatives. So kicking off with, with these monthly member meetings, um, which is fantastic initiative. Uh, thanks, Andrea, for organizing this. It's a great way to bring our members together in a time that's, um, you know, we've just passed the national you know, the, the federal election. So um, it's really great to keep the momentum going. Um, we're also working on ways to make uh, contributing ideas easier. We're setting up new uh, committees and working groups to focus on the areas that are, are really pivotal to what we're doing right now. And of course, we've got more elections to contest, uh, which is the best part of being part of a political party. Um, so Victorian and New South Wales state elections um, are the next ones on the list, and we're in the process of coordinating those. Uh, so stay tuned. We're going to have heaps of news and announcements uh, on the Discord channels, um, in your email boxes, on the website. Um, any way that we can get a hold of you, we will be trying to do that. So please stay tuned. Um, lots of exciting stuff ahead. And, uh, and on that, we might move across to the next slide if we can, because as, uh, as the current secretary as well, um, we've been keeping track of our membership. Um, so I've put together some numbers since around about February, uh, which is when we did the consolidation of our memberships between the, um, the, the founding branches. Um, so the five groups and then opened up for membership for Fusion as a whole, uh, which is a really exciting time. So this slide shows um, 1,784 active members, uh, which, is, which is really cool, um, across all the branches and Fusion as a whole. Um, and you can see the distribution there pretty much across all of those, those branches. So we'll keep a, a track of that. We had a huge uplift. You see 327 um, members since February just in Fusion. And that's what, uh, that's what happens around an election. We get a, a swarm of excitement. Um, which is amazing to see, and we're really keen to to um, you know get everyone involved in in moving forward. Uh, I might just hold off on questions until the end, if that's okay, Austin. I see your hand up. Um, that'd be a second. Um, if we move across to the next slide, just keeping track also on uh, new members. So the sign up since we started um, tracking these and uh, bringing the, the membership groups together. So February, you can see we had a, a small, small amount and then it picked up all the way up until May. Um, don't get too despondent if next month doesn't look quite the same on the same trajectory. Um, May was the election month. So that's where the, uh, the bulk of the interest came in. Um, but it's really good to see uh, that our, our movement and the policies that we brought together um, as a collective really spoke um, to, to the electorate and the, the people. So for anyone who's on this call, who's a new member since, um, since then, a member of, of Fusion, welcome aboard, glad to have you. Um, obviously anyone who was an existing member or a new member of any of the branches also also welcome. We're all in this together, so it's it's fantastic um, to see see this level of growth. 
and uh, I'll be continuing to report these kind of figures month on month as well, just to keep everyone in the loop of what's happening. Cool. That was the end of the membership section, wasn't it, Roger? It was. That's uh, that's me for now. I'm not sure if you wanted if uh, if I wanted to. Uh, Austin had his hand up. We could answer questions now. I'll we'll leave it to the very very end. Yeah, if it's particularly about membership, then maybe let's answer it now. Yeah, I was just going to say I joined after I heard about the merger, but when I joined, I was still directed to one of two. I think I ended up in the science party's website. Mm. So would I be showing up? I'd be showing up here in in the red on these bar graphs or on the blue. Uh, yep. So you would, if you were directed through to science, you were probably signed up as a science science member. So you would be a red. So um, I just say that I, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have joined the science party. I only joined the fusion party once the parties are joined together. Right. That, was, that, that actually made it interesting to more interesting to me. Um, yeah, cool. So just if, if and when you're reading that data, if there were people like me who came through uh, one of those uh, branch party funnels, if it was after the uh, in my case, it was after the 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 merger had been announced. So I, I didn't consider myself as joining science. I considered myself as joining Fusion. Awesome. And that's really good to hear as well. Um, if you want us to update your actual membership record, feel free to email through. Um, you can either email me directly, um, secretary at, or there's contact at um, fusionparty.org.au uh, and we'll update that for you. Um, but yeah, it's... Ultimately, it ends up being the same in terms of fusion. Um, everyone's treated equally. We will be working out how we um, obviously interact between all the branches and whether that's that has any particular sway, but ultimately our, our collective efforts are going to be as fusion in terms of political uh, movement. So absolutely um, happy to have you on board with fusion or science or both, but uh, we'll, we'll get you updated. Actually, special thanks, thanks Austin, for pointing out a, a process that uh, we hadn't updated um, when you signed up, that uh, you weren't receiving emails. So we fixed that up, thanks to your um, proactive message. Is <coughs> um, there another question there from Robert? Yeah, I was wondering if you guys did the uh, duplication of a, a participant uh, so that uh, you will not have people possibly written in under multiple brackets. Uh, yep, so all of the um, membership lists, um, mo most of the membership lists are all now managed in one database. Um, so we have the ability to, to seek out uh, duplicates. So we're making sure that we're not, not duplicating records. Um, slight piece of interest for anyone who, who wants to know. Uh, so the Pirate Party has, obviously, if you want to look into the, um, the, the core tenets of, of the Pirate Party, definitely stronger on, on privacy and, um, and security aspects. And as such, their membership database is kept separate um, but we do keep an eye on on both of those those membership databases make sure that we're not not doubling up so all of these should uh 99 sure should be uh unique records so yeah no no duplications sorry i'm might have to mute David L here. No, I'm not actually. Roger, are you able to do that? Oh, thanks. Oh, thanks, David. Whichever one of you did that. I cool. Um all right. Was there any other questions on membership or shall we move on to the finances briefly? Hello. I think we're good to go. Um, Robert, if you wanted to put your hand down, unless you had another question, and we can move on. Cheers. All right. Now, Michael, am I missing anything for the finances here? 
Uh, so, I think it's just a reiteration. The thing I've got, I've got two uh, more slides that should be there. Oh, let's see if they show up or whether I've got to close and open it again. Yeah, it might be that you needed to refresh. Hopefully, the second one is there. Um, oh, oh, okay. So you might need to refresh for the. Or actually, maybe not, we don't worry about it. Um, I'll just speak to this one. Um, so um, a quick disclaimer um, and slight apology that um, there is a lot of work involved, especially after an election, um, getting all the financial records together. Um, we... Sorry, I should introduce Michael Morosky, our treasurer, who uh, <laughs> does a lot of work to reconcile all of the, uh, the incoming and outgoing um, cash, uh, especially at election time. <clears throat> Indeed. So there's a lot of, um, so yeah, thanks everyone. I'm Michael Morosky. Um, I, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> there are a number of uh, obligations that we have, uh, especially after elections, to, to report on our donations and our expenditure. Um, so, uh, but we generally, uh, coming from the Science Party and moving on to Fusion, uh, we will be doing the best we can to be as transparent and open as possible um, with as much of it as, as, uh, as our finances as we can. Um, we will also be, as Roger said, um, with membership, with finances, we'll also be looking to provide at least monthly updates uh, with both what money we're receiving, what money we have, and what we're spending money on um, to make sure that sort of members know that we are uh, putting money towards things that are uh, what sort of we are we're supporting your interests and um, and uh, we are doing everything that we can to sort to, to, to make use of that. Um, so this, um, I just, <clears throat> in terms of at the bottom here, I'll kind of go from the bottom up. Um, I, I'm gonna be providing just some information on donations, um, but electoral expenditure is still in the process of being consolidated and uh, reconciled. So I uh, apologies that I will not be able to provide much detailed information on expenses at this time. Um, now, however, over the course of this is basically effectively the life of um, the the uh, the lifetime of fusion at this point. So this is from about February. Um, we have received a pretty decent number of donations over um, this period. Um, then this totals to thirty three thousand and two hundred eighty two dollars and forty two cents. Um, this uh, the. <clears throat> and of that, $23,030 has been made via uh, the, the website to uh, candidates via their individual pages. Um, the reason I point that out is just to ensure that um, that money has got, will, is, is, is to go to reimbursing those candidates for their expenditure, um, of which, for the most part, it came out of their pockets. So most of our candidates, uh, as um, is mostly most probably know, um, there, there are a lot of expenses as to running as a candidate. Not only is there a $2,000 fee just to get on the ballot paper, uh, which is very, very expensive and, and locks a lot of people out, uh, but just things like flyers and core flutes and various other expenses do make a big, um, do create a sort of a, a, big, a big barrier. Um, and it does cost a lot of money to, to be effective in an election. So, um, a huge thanks to everyone who did donate to us. Uh, and there are obviously all sorts of things we'll need to spend money on going forward. There's various just administration expenses, things, various services that we pay for, um, various IT expenses and things like that, that we'll, we'll have ongoing. <clears throat> and so uh, the money that sits in sort of the, the, the party coffers will we'll go towards that. And we have a little, we have a decent little sort of war chest sort of left over that we will use to go uh, towards those things. Um, and just a, a, another quick note, um, we are reaching the end of the financial year and there is a donation of approximately $1,500, uh, sorry, a cap of $1,500 approximately um, that you are able to uh, claim as a tax deduction for donations to political parties. Uh, so if there, if there is, uh, if you do have interest in donating further, that that is a little incentive for you to do so. Um, but yeah, in any case, thank you everyone who has donated so far um, and has contributed. We'll make sure that we are doing, as I said, doing everything we can to uh, use that money effectively. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. But as I said, notice um, there will probably be some 
limited detail that I can provide at this point, but I do promise to provide uh, more ongoing and more detailed reports uh, in following meetings. Thanks, Michael. And it should be noted, it's $2,000 for each candidate to run in the election. So it, at 10 Senate candidates and nine lower house candidates, that's uh, $38,000 just off the bat there, just to enter the race. And then in comparison to the amount of money that the major parties and the um, high profile teal independents spent, um, it's, it's barely a drop in the ocean. So I think we, we spend our money quite efficiently yeah, so one one item I'll definitely be looking to be, be looking to provide you shortly is a sort of a cost per vote value. Uh, so we've looked at these in previous elections where um, I mean it depends a lot on um, with between different parties, uh, and there is obviously a, a certain amount of you know, diminishing returns of, of, of funds to some degree as well, but like it's it's not completely linear. Uh, but there are, but sort of larger parties will find uh, the the usual expectation uh, and, and previous experiences, something about we, we sort of pay at least uh, 10 times less per vote. Um, oh, sorry, that's a good question, Gary. Um, I added this, uh, I added that item just as in one of our particular expenses that is related to donations, particularly. Um, Stripe is the payment gateway that we use to receive payments, uh, donations via our website, uh, and they do charge 30 cents times one, uh, 30 cents plus the donation amount times 1.7%, 1. Uh, 1. Um, sorry, I said that very poorly, um, but they provide they charge a very small fee. Um, it's relatively small in total, but um, but um, four, basically 428 is a portion of that, uh, that donation, that total donation that we just have to give to Stripe for receiving those donations. So um, yeah, so there are certain ways we can sometimes avoid it by pe with people requesting um, to pay directly to the bank account, but that's a little bit trickier uh, because it requires a fair bit of admin or an additional admin. Um, but it, unfortunately, it's just the cost of doing business in other cases. There's all sorts of costs that uh, we do our best to avoid when we can, but um, there's, there's, yeah, there's only so much we can do. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's just one of those things we can do. But again, I'll, I'll, I'll provide a lot more detail on these items uh, in, the, in the future, in the future. Cool. Any other questions there? If not, we'll just uh, uh, move on to a little bit more of uh, party updates before we get on to the election results. Cool. Thanks, everyone, and thank you, Michael. Um, I just wanted to go through the the sort of timeline that we've been working on since, um, well, since uh, 10 months ago. Um, it's sort of the, the birth of fusion. So I just wanted to show this, just to show the, the extremely tight timelines that we've been working on, just to put everything um, uh, in the formation of fusion and the election period that we had into context. So it was only, eight, uh, only 10 months ago that a bill was in introduced to Parliament, the Electoral Legislation Amendment Bill, also known as the Party Registration Integrity Bill. And that was the piece of legislation that proposed to um, make the minimum membership numbers for uh, political parties increase from 500 members to 1,500 members. Um, so all of the political parties, unless you've got a member elected to Parliament, then you're exempt from it. Every other political party that wants to remain registered until August last year had to uh, prove that they had 500 members in between every election. That was tripled to 1,500. And that was the catalyst for the, the talks that um, um, inspired the merger into fusion, which um, I think we all agree was uh, a fortuitous, was a good move in any case. So we were glad probably to have that, um, that push to combine our resources and become a larger, stronger party. And then uh, it was six months, sorry, only six weeks after that, these talks happened very quickly. It was six weeks after that at the end of September last year that the leadership of Science, Pirate, Secular and Vote Planet, the four federal parties um, got together and decided that we would move forward with this merger. 
in October, Vote Planet applied to change its name. So Vote Planet's the, the entity that continued on. And then it wasn't until um, February that um, the Australian Electoral Commission processed our new membership application to uh, say that we'd passed our 1500 member check. It wasn't until the 1st of March that the name change was approved. So we, we felt quite uh, messed around by this that we'd applied to change our party name in the middle of October. And it took 19 weeks till the start of March before we had our name change approved. They warned that that should be about a nine week process. So it was more than double that for us. And we were getting quite nervous. And that uh, definitely was no help with the um, with trying to get stuck into early campaigning as we knew an election was on the cards probably in May. And it was early April that the election was called for the 21st of May, as we know. So that, um, that set the scene for the election results. Sorry, for the election campaign. Look, sorry, I've missed a slide here. I'm going to just go back to the updates here. <clears throat> just wanted to say that we are, um, yeah, so after that whirlwind coming together of the, uh, the four federal parties as well as the ACT registered Climate Change Justice Party, we're now undergoing this pretty extensive and um, deep review process where we'll be drawing out a lot of things that we haven't put into words. So we know we've, we all share a lot of, um, a lot of the same values. We wanna see the same things happen in Australian politics, but we haven't uh, put all of those into words yet. And that's, um, from my point of view, that's um, been uh, a difficult one to navigate around as we're trying to inspire people and connect with people who would, um, who would want to get involved and to vote for us. So that work is happening now. And also as part of the bigger communication push that we're doing, there's a um, um, planning stages now for a Fusion Party podcast. And Saha Khalili, who was our read candidate, is heading that up. So if you're interested, please get in touch. Um, have a look, uh, find us on Discord if you uh, if you're an extremely online person. So there are a few things coming up. All right, let's get on to the election results. Uh, so we ran in five states um, for the Senate, um, two candidates in each state and in nine electorates in the lower house, the House of Representatives. Now the results were actually remarkably similar across the board around about one and a half percent of the primary lower house vote, which is, it's actually pretty cool to, if you're in one of these electorates to, to go around and just know that one in, one in about 70 people voted for a fusion candidate. That's pretty cool. Um, I mean, we always would be hoping to, um, well, you know, we're in it to win it. And we would also be hoping to, um, crack the 4%, which is where we get our money back. We get our um, $2,000 uh, nomination fee back as well as $10,000 uh, and then a bit more on a per vote and per receipt kind of basis. So all the major parties get uh, a lot of public funding back at every election. A lot of small parties don't. So, uh, that's one, one big reason we want to crack the 4% of the primary vote is so that our election fees, um, nomination fees, don't just go to propping up the major party coffers. Now, we've, I should call out uh, Benelong and Dobell, where we won over 2% of the vote. Those were the electorates where we drew the number one position on the, um, the ticket, on the, the voting paper. So we know some people donkey vote, and they just go one, two, three, four down the... Um, down the ticket. Uh, Nichols in Victoria was a, an unusual electorate. It's one of those electorates in rural Victoria where the Liberals and the Nationals run against each other. I hate it when they do that. Uh, so there was not much vote share available after, um, after that. So uh, Andrea Otto um, ran a strong campaign there in the Shepparton area and surrounds. Yeah, but apart from that, just very similar results across the board. 
Um, we've done a little bit of analysis. Um, so Tom O'Neill and Eve Slavich have been looking at some numbers. So might uh, now, oh no, sorry, I'll just go through quickly some Senate results. Um, so I oh know this is a lot of numbers. Um, these are all of the, the primary uh, votes for all the Senate groups in the five states where we ran. Um, it's not a mistake. New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland all had the same number, 23 columns on the ballot, just as a coincidence. Just wanted to point out as a point of interest here, highlighting uh, immediately behind the majors, Liberal, Labor and the Greens. Um, after that, there's a big jump to this sort of second tier of parties, Pauline Hanson's One Nation, United Australia Party, Legalised Cannabis and LDP, the Liberal Democratic Party. Um, yeah, I just wanted to point out legalised cannabis as a single issue party that didn't run any lower house candidates. I just thought it was remarkable that they were up there in this cohort. Um, One Nation and UAP, by contrast, ran, um, ran lower house candidates in almost every seat. And we, you know, we understand that there's an effect that increases your Senate vote when you run lower house candidates. And LDP ran candidates in about half of all lower house seats. I think the fact that, um, I'm editorialising here, I think the fact that legalised cannabis uh, is up in this group, um, despite being a single issue party um, that didn't run any lower house candidates means it is perhaps an issue whose time has come and we should just legalise cannabis already. Fusion definitely has its own cohort down here. So there's Sustainable Australia and the Australian Democrats also ran in the same five states that we did. And we clustered with them um, very reliably. Also just point out Reason, uh, which ran in New South Wales, Vic and Queensland. We thought they might be some of our strongest competitors given their similar uh, platform, similar feel. Interesting that the National Party in South Australia is... Um, they run separately from the Liberals and, um, and Fusion was just behind them in South Australia. So that's interesting. Um, speaks to the, the unique situations in each of the states. All right, um, moving on to some analysis. Uh, Eve, are you around? Uh, yes, hello. Uh everyone <laughs> um yeah i'm i'm eve i i know some people i don't know some people i've just been hanging around the science party for quite a while and, oh, eve has uh, run for the the science party in the senate and done done statistical analysis uh for the science party for the last two elections and that is her day job as well so yeah i'm a statistician it. so if you have uh questions and data that you think can be answered with um, that you think can help you answer that question I'm, I'm always happy to um, to help um, so Andrea um, asked me a couple of questions that I had a look at and I this is a very modest contribution there's obviously um, more analysis that can be done but one of the questions was um, yeah, how do the lower house candidates that we run affect our Senate reach? Um, and so uh, I've done some analysis that indicates it, that this year, um, our the seats where we had a lower house candidate were associated with 120% increase in our Senate vote at those booths. Oops, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, compared to... Um, you know, places where we didn't have a, a Senate candidate running. And that um, just to, yeah, that sounds really awesome. The uncertainty on that is 87% um, increase to 158% increase. Um, and, but there's no um, demographic adjustment done yet. Um, so uh, do you explain what that means? Like we run, um, lower house candidates in seats where we have um, like a sympathetic population. Um, and so some of that increase is probably just um, 
uh, confounded with the fact that um, more of our people live in those places. Um, so in um, 2016, I did a similar analysis uh, for Science Party and the estimate was much lower. It was a 53% increase in our Senate vote um, associated with, um, yeah, for places where we had a, a lower house candidate. Um, and in that analysis, I, I had um, ABS demographic data that I, um, and so I sort of did some analysis on what, the demographic factors increase like are associated with places where we get more votes and then looked at any boost that came from the lower house candidate that was additional to that um so it was a bit less yeah but this is basically yeah you can show the box plots and <laughs> yeah we're just clicking um, everywhere tonight yeah. <laughs> that's all right uh, yeah this is the cat the, yeah these are the seats um you know where we, so where we had lower house candidates, the true is where we have a lower house candidate and the false is where we didn't. And this is um, the booth, the percentage uh, of the first preference votes that, that Fusion got um, per booth. And I don't know, some people might know what box plots are, but this line shows in the middle shows the median. So um, half of the votes are above that line and half of half of the um, booths had below that line. And, and, and the, it's the upper and um, the third and first quartile of votes. But basically um, what the box plots show is that we did get a lot more Senate votes at booths where we had a lower house candidate. Um, oh yeah, so worth noting that's a, um, a logarithmic scale. So that's something like uh, 0.3, something percent points mm. point seven. yeah it's a log yeah it is a log scale um uh the box plots look a bit squashed the other way um i think there might have been a dot point on the previous slide andrea that i didn't talk to uh yeah so yeah so i yeah i'd expect our lower house boost to be a bit less than 120 percent um but um for anyone that's yet thinking, so the the lower house boost is multiplicative, so it's still strategic to run in places that are um, favourable demographically, like because um, you're boosting up, like you're multiplying, so you want to multiply a big number, not a small number, um, with the boost. Uh, yeah, and so the other question that Andrea asked was me, uh, was um, what effect does having a volunteer at the booth have? Because um, this was a question that we did previously look at. Uh, and so I just looked at um, how much our, our lower house, yeah, this is, um, I did it two analyses, one for the lower house, seats and one for the upper house seats, uh, upper house vote, and looked at uh, places where we had volunteers. Uh, so the candidates, thank you, you all sent through um, uh, data on which booths had a volunteer on the day and, and some of them for pre-poll. And, and so we found that those booths had a 6% increase in the lower house vote, um, but there's pretty high uncertainty on this estimate. Um, so it could be from one to 12% um, increase. Uh, and that was in the lower house. And in the upper house, it was um, higher. It was a 17% increase in our upper house vote. Um, also very uncertain, two to 33% <laughs> increase. Um, so, uh yeah so that's um that's in 2016 i did a similar analysis and we actually found that we had a 40 percent increase in our upper house vote um and we adjusted for demographics of the booth area uh which i just haven't had time to do so 
yeah, so it's a little bit um, less of an impact of volunteers. Um, but yeah, the, the data is pretty patchy. So um, yeah, I wouldn't, um, yeah, I, 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 I would, I would feel um, not very confident about like saying that volunteers don't affect the vote. It's just that it's a, it's less of a boost than the having just having the lower house candidate on the ballot. Um, yeah, um, and then I there's heaps of stuff that I have not um, adjusted for, like how many placards were around the place and that sort of stuff. So Tom. O'Neill and I have some dreams of writing a report on this stuff uh, <laughs> when we've had more time to look into it. Um, yeah, any uh, any questions? <laughs> yeah, I'll just note that Liam's noted in the comments here that legalised cannabis, um, just correcting my error, legalised cannabis did run one lower house candidate in Longman in Queensland. Um, and Liam also mentions that um, um they used to see roughly a doubling of votes for volunteers so it's yeah definitely folk wisdom was that it's a significant boost to the lower house vote to have a uh, a volunteer but yeah there could be other factors at play it's also just been an interesting election as well you could say there were 151 elections going on around the country yeah um, yeah, and it's um, it's not as a statistician and a scientist, it's not very good data that we've got to work with. We certainly yeah. haven't done any randomization of our volunteer <laughs> placement and stuff like that. Um, so there's there's so many caveats with this stuff, but it is interesting to um, to have a look at. Um, yeah, and Liam mentions uh, pre polling as well. So now. What is it, one in three people vote before the day? And we don't have all the pre-polling. Um, pre-polling stations were in this analysis. Um, um, so I don't think I had postal votes, but um, mm. yeah, but um, yeah, we, we didn't, um, yeah. So Post the notes that there might've been less interaction at the booths as well due to COVID concerns. And that's fair enough. It's just, it's impossible to know the extent of how COVID affected people's willingness to take a piece of paper. Our volunteer, this, this, this analysis just looked at, um, you know, volunteers as like a binary, was there a volunteer there or not? And I know that our volunteer coverage is not like, um, you know, it's not like eight till 6 p.m. Um, at, typically um so I, it could be that the doubling is if you have like a cluster of volunteers you know like the major parties they'll have like three or four people it's like a little party atmosphere there um and yeah that's very hard for us to get um yeah so i don't know the where the doubling comes from um but it doesn't play out in our data. Um, and I don't, the major parties wouldn't know because they don't have, they have volunteers everywhere. So they also don't have data <laughs> on the effect. Um, yeah. Yeah, Marley asks about the uncertainty for the 2016 stats. Um, lost to the ages. Lost to the ages, yes, sorry. <laughs> Mm. it could it could be um yeah it could be it it just didn't it's just not what we thought this time um yeah was there anything else of your slides because with 10 minutes to go we might move on to tom's slides oh there's the oh, graph. oh that's just the plot oh okay yeah there was something else um so um, this is the volunteer, the places where we had a volunteer versus the place that we didn't have a volunteer. Um, and um, yeah, so it's, they're quite similar in the distribution of their votes. And if you just go to the next vote uh, slide, um, 
this is just something interesting to note that where the Greens were getting a higher proportion of the vote um, was also where we were getting a higher proportion of the vote, um, lower house vote across, this is across the booths in all this, in all the lower house seats that we ran in. Um, and so I guess that's just to draw the, um, make the point that um, there's something about the underlying demographics that just um, makes people sympathetic to us. Yeah, seems to also be associated with Green's vote. Mm. All right. Yep. Let's switch over. Oops. All right. So here's some extra or well, further work that uh, Tom O'Neill has done as well. So, uh, Tom, are you about? Yep. Yeah. Um, I know you're suffering from the COVID right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, now, what were these findings about here? So, this was, uh, well, I should probably preface I'm not a statistician. Um, I am almost entirely self-taught in functional programming, but I thought I'd give this a go. Um, and then I caught COVID, so I didn't really have much chance to work through it. So this should be pretty quick, I think, um, mostly just looking at um, some of the major things about this sort of summarized in a few graphs. So this was the, um, I sort of thought it might be interesting to see how voters sort of viewed or, or voted for their party um, in 20, 2016 to 2019, which is the 2019 column, and then 2019 to 2022 as percentage of swing, um, where almost everything looked up except for the LMP. Um, and I think Andrea sent me a tally room sort of article where there's been that mention of the historic low major party um, primary vote is probably mostly coming from people not voting for the LNP, not necessarily Labor. Hmm. Um, Labor was already at low levels, but yeah, they didn't really drop this time. Mm. Um, yeah, it was pretty, pretty harsh to the LNP, really. They're almost consistently negative. Um, if you click. I then sort of grouped, um, grouped candidates that weren't these parties but also weren't um united nation or one nation um just very dirty quick sort of grouping uh where an, an electorate had a new candidate running um whether it was from a minor party or a completely new party like ours and uh the percentage of the vote in 2019 compared to 2022 was uh just a little bit lower so we didn't necessarily do any any better, and this is probably um, consistent with the sentiment going around that this was kind of the indies' turn to 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 win some votes. Mm. So yeah, new new candidates and probably a lot of the minor parties didn't do as well as they expected. Yeah, there's maybe a space there for us to explain the the benefits of a minor party or a smaller party having a, a consistent platform. You you know, I feel like there's a message in there to say, you know what you're getting when you vote Fusion. It's all on our website. So if you click through, this was kind of just my very quick, uh, what did I just include in this new candidate group? Um, it does include some some of the more well-known parties like um, Liberal Democrats and Shooters and Fishers and Farmers. So it might be a future idea to sort of go through and tidy that up a bit just to represent a lot more of these uh minor parties rather than just a new candidate so i thought i'd just include that just to as a disclaimer as to what i just showed you um but i'd imagine it would be pretty low regardless 
Hmm. We show up as SOPA for some reason. Does anyone know why we've got that abbreviation with the Electoral Commission? That's us. No one knows. It's weird. Um, yeah, so then just... Uh... Let's save our planet. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, just the average um, primary vote, I guess, was kind of all increased, even for the minor parties that weren't new candidates, so rerunning um, minor parties uh, still did better. So new candidates and LNP really got the shaft in this election, I think. Um, that's pretty much a summary slide. Yeah, again, uh, Labour sort of probably didn't increase all that much. Um, pretty similar. Next slide. Yeah. Oops. Um, this is just lower house science versus fusion. We also did uh, a little bit worse, I guess. <laughs> But it's again, it was two months where the name was finalized, I guess it's, yeah. um, there's probably a lot to um, decompile in, in this analysis that I just didn't have time to have a look at. Like I said, this is a very, very quick sort of just overlook of um, especially 2019 versus 2022. Yeah, I think it's interesting that um, the one place where we ran this time and last time, two, two places were Barara and Grindler. So there's just so many factors out of our control. So this time around, obviously, um, the candidate for Grindler is Anthony Albanese and his profile was that much higher. Um, there were there was a progressive independent in the seat. So, uh, and last time around in Grindler, the Science Party drew the number one position on the ballot, which is worth about 1% of the vote. Um, and yeah, in, in Sydney, we, we ran a very proactive campaign in Sydney, but we also ran, uh, you know, we were very present and on the ground in some electorates, including Reid, like lots of on the ground campaigning. And there just, there wasn't much to go around after. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people seemed to want to make sure they voted Labor, uh, just to make sure their vote really counted for Labor, the lack of yeah. understanding of preferential voting. I think each time I look at that something new in these graphs, I always think it, this is the election where people just wanted the LMP out, I think. Uh, yeah, I decided to look at the ballot position and it does follow sort of like a linear sort of um, trend. I don't think that it necessarily is linear, uh, but it definitely looks like it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you go through the next slide yeah. as well. That's, I mean, that's very interesting. Like I've talked about the first position, never really thought this election about later positions on the ballot. The only thing I could think of off the top of my head on the train to work to sort of very quickly uh, assess whether this possibly was a, a sort of number one, um, like the, the fact that we were number one was the postal vote. Maybe someone would have a chance to actually sit down and have a look at what was on their ballot and research it. Um, and it does look like it, it spreads a bit more, but not really. I, I think that the number one position definitely holds an advantage. I find the absent vote very interesting. So that's when people are voting on the day, but out of their electorate, that we consistently seem to do better in those. Maybe it's, it's people who vote fusion are never at home. What what could possibly account for that? I don't know. I have no ideas. Yeah. I think mean, that's a, yeah, that's not a statistical question. That's a, a political question. This is, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's percentage of votes. So it would be probably not constituting that much of our numbers. It might be less than 100 or something like that. Yeah, it is very small numbers of votes. Maybe it's. No, could it really be a statistical anomaly across all of these? I don't know. Oh. Um, yeah, so I thought that was just something interesting to think about in these 
the ballot position. I think number one definitely has its advantage. I think it's it might also go beyond just the donkey vote or the um, if you're walking in thinking that you're going to put Labour before Liberal or, or vice versa or whatever, even if you scan down and you see fusion, science, pirates, secular and so forth, hmm. you might think then to put that first as you start scanning down trying to find your party. Whereas if you're at the bottom, you might they might just find their party first and then put it. But I don't know. I can't get into the mind of the average vote off. Uh, can, I, can I make a comment there? Because I did an absentee vote, whatever you call it. Yeah. And um, where I went, um, it was almost like, sit down and have a cup of tea, can we look after you? So we were given a table and a chair, and there's only one other person doing it. And um, there were two people assigned to look after us <clears throat> and attend to us. And we had conversations about all sorts of things to do with voting and um, whether or not uh, that is the case everywhere you go, whether or not um, the absentees are given special treatment because they have to be so careful not to get it wrong. Um, I mean, the staff have to be so careful not to get it wrong. And also having the table and the chair to spread it all out. Uh, and But that would mean the same result would be reflected, I'm sure, in postal votes because people have time to do that with a postal vote, sit at a chair and spit it out on the table and really study it. Do you know what the postal vote thing is? Uh, is that on there as well? Postal, yeah, that's in the top left on this slide. It, um, it didn't have that same big boost effect. It was sort of it was a little higher than the average, but just a little. Absentee votes were definitely much higher. But as Tom says, it's uh, small numbers. So it's so hard to say. Um, Austin notes, unless the difference is people have, ex have preferences explained to them when doing absentee voting. Is that something um, you think might be possible, Cami? Everyone gets that attention um, to, to possibly have... Mm. There, is, there, is no, yeah, there is no doubt that the that is the impression that the two people on this task gave me. And I, I did say that um, not many people came their way during the day and they were thrilled to have somebody there that they could talk to and show their knowledge to and answer questions. And that was that day, Andrea, they told me that you can vote both above the line and below the line in the Senate. Um, mm. Interesting. <laughs> I mean, they were the sort of conversations we were having. <laughs> yep. um, so, yeah, that's a good point. Having someone there who's knowledgeable, who can answer your questions, because that doesn't happen at home, that's for sure. Hmm. Oops. Sorry. Yeah. I think we can move forward. Yep. Sorry. I've got a few, yeah, just a few slides here. Um, I guess... Yeah, you can see sort of it was pretty um, pretty similar across each state that we ran in for the Senate. Um, and again, you can see that um, what Eve showed, uh, those that are coloured for where we run a lower house, uh, obviously standing much above the, the rest here, on, at least on this scale. Um, as well, I also noticed if you look at the sort of top um, uh, areas where we didn't run a lower house, you can see um, Melbourne, Perth, um Sydney um obviously so, so these major cities we're, we're getting sort of sitting at our upper end of the vote so I don't know if, if anyone in the party or historically sort of knows why that might be the case hmm. do we have like a big presence in those areas science ran in Perth in 2019 and also the 2018 by-election it's also possible we had some volunteer presence in the major cities or just the people who actually live in the CBD or a different demographic? I think I that it actually comes down to there were fewer other parties running. Mm. It just fewer okay. on the ballot. I think this is, yeah, this is where we would want to look at sort of a lot more of the, um, well, this is, this is Senate vote as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Want to look at... Um, a lot more in the 
deeper analysis. I think Eve would probably say there's need to look at the census data and the demographics of these areas. Because oh, Sydney, of... Sydney, there is um, where science had a very strong campaign last time around, and Bradfield was identified as demographically a very uh, strong science electorate. Uh, Owen, did you want to ask a question? Oh, yeah, I was curious. I, sorry, I didn't realise I had my hand. Um, I guess these statistics, uh, they're, they're not completely, oh, not much in our control. I wonder, um, I hope it doesn't derail the meeting too much, sorry, but I wonder if there's any insight into, like, you know, how we compare in issues to the other parties. And, like, you know, I know, you know for instance, um, climate parties got a lot of votes. I wonder, like, you know, there wouldn't be as much room to distinguish ourselves there, for instance. Um, yeah, I don't know if we were going to cover that sort of thing at all in this meeting. Mm. Probably not so much in this meeting. It was on my slate to sort of, probably not comprehensively, but definitely align some of the parties with major issues and then see how we compare to them. Because like you say, if, if we lost a lot of votes, perhaps to parties that were voting on climate issues um you know that that might explain where some of our votes went yeah there was also that bit of eaves about uh, the correlation with greens votes which mm. is interesting that there's still enough room there that our vote can go up in tandem or in concert with the greens vote so there's there's a lot of extra a lot of extra stuff goes along with voting greens Um, yeah, and then I think there's just two more slides here. Um, just comparing, again, uh, I only had time to compare two parties. So I did science, um, and that's supposed to be Fusion 2022. Uh, that's my COVID brain working this morning. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it doesn't look like there's anything substantial because we the only votes that we lost were where, if I was to colour... Uh, most of these on the right hand side well, we got more in the 2019 um senate these were where we ran lower house in 2019 um so most of what we're look we should be looking at is probably that middle bunch in the middle where there wasn't really all that much difference um so yeah sydney kingsford smith um i think watson and something else there were all um 2019 science party lower house candidates um, so that effect also occurred in the um, 2019 election for Science Party, at least. Um, and then the next slide is just um, uh, the Pirates, again, Fusion 2022. Um, I don't know too much about um, the history of the Pirate uh, Party and their sort of campaign. So maybe this is something for them to sort of look at and digest and discuss um, how they sort of did. Uh, compared to their 2019. Um, but yeah, it, it's probably something to sort of sit down and digest and look a bit more into. Hmm. Yeah, I'll be keen to dig into some more stats uh, at our leisure. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Tom, for doing this with uh, COVID brain. Uh, it's, uh, it's a wild ride, COVID. So yeah, thanks again. Um, and that brings us to the end of our statistics and we're a little over time. Um, don't think we had any hands up unless I'm missing that. Is that correct? Let's go back to the main present. Oh, nope, I won't. Yes, I will. Any final questions for Eve or Tom while we've got them here? Oops, sorry. Um, is it possible to post the um, post the uh, the slides with the recording, please? Because there's sort of a bit of a there was a bit of an overlap there, anyway. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> I'll put them up on the. Um, uh, let's say the event page, put a link to it from there. Um, all right, well, um, 
that's the um, the end of the formal proceedings. Um, thanks everyone for being here for our first monthly member meeting. Um, and from now on, the monthly member meetings will move to the last Wednesday of each month. So the next one's coming up on the 27th of July. Um, and they're all up on the website. So you can, if you RSVP to them now, you should in fact get an email with the details, which was not working for the for tonight's meeting. Um, so sorry about that. Uh, sorry for the people who got caught there. Um, now, actually, um, I know a lot of us have to head off uh, right now to a, another meeting at 8.15. Um, I'm hoping um, if I stop the recording and leave, it won't kick anybody out. So let's try to do that.